both of you have mentioned uh, formal methods. And so one thing I want to touch on at the beginning is in, in basically in simple terms, um, what is formal methods and what does that mean? Because a lot of times people get the impression, including myself, that formal methods kind of gives me the feeling that that means the software is going to be perfect every time it's rolled out the door. But uh, that's not really a good description of formal methods, is it? What, what's your take? What is formal methods? Well, um, I, I guess one way to describe it is that when you when you when you are programming, then ultimately you're doing mathematics and teaching something mathematical to the computer. But a lot of time, if you, if you look at your code, then you don't really realize that that's what you're doing. It doesn't doesn't look anything like mathematics in a, in a paper and formal methods are one way to basically bring it bring bring that back and and get your programs in a in a form where you can reason about them like you can reason about mathematics in a paper and where you can prove certain properties of it and also have those proofs be checked by the computer sometimes or ideally although that's um that's quite involved so what we do at IOHK sometimes is something that's called lightweight formal methods, which is going into the direction of that and um, and basically making your code easier to reason about and getting somewhere in the direction, sometimes using computer-aided proofs, sometimes doing proofs by hand, but basically getting getting it getting it closer to 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 mathematics. So that's that's one one take. Jared, do you want to? Add on to that? Oh, that's a good description. There's certainly a, a lot of things that fall under that umbrella of formal methods. And at one extreme is um, what you said <clears throat> about, uh, you know, the, it does exactly what uh, what you said it does. Of course, that can fall apart at the edges where, you know, you may make assumptions. Um, uh, but th th that is one extreme of formal methods. Uh, the other extreme, uh, just explicitly stating um, what it is you expect the program to do is already a huge step in the right direction. Just having a specification or uh, stating in some sort of unvague uh, terms um, what your system does. So what would you tell a beginning software engineer? So let's say someone just graduated um, with their software engineering degree and they want to get into formal methods. What would you tell them is the most interesting thing about formal methods? I think there is, um, among some programmers, a lot of fascination with mathematics, especially in the functional programming world where people do get excited about seeing um, some of the words that they saw in math classes appear in programming classes, and that doesn't always happen. Um, and so to some people, that's really exciting. So I think showing them where the overlap between math and computer science for some people can be a huge draw and can be really exciting. Um, and then the other thing, on the other side, uh, if you don't care about that at all, um, it may be that after you've been programming for a while, you see the same sorts of errors happen over and over again. And um, it might be that some of the simple things that you can do to check some of these things, um, it would be appealing to them to, to stop shooting themselves in the foot on uh, mistakes that are easy to make um, with, that you can uh, attempt to avoid. How does formal methods make Cardano a better cryptocurrency? Well, ultimately it's, it's about assurance right because if you if you want to have this working if you want to have this be a viable infrastructure if people trust their money in there then you want to make sure that it's that it's not misbehaving that it does what it's supposed to do like in other high assurance areas like um, <clears throat> aviation or finance generally or also uh, medical software you want to make sure that the things are actually implemented correctly and um for that, we are doing multiple things at IOHK. We are working together with the researchers who actually look at those those complicated uh, proof of stake um, systems and they devise protocols that are that are secure as long as you have a, an honest majority, and that also deliver proofs of this security. And then we we work with formal methods, so we basically transfer the contents of the research paper, which is prose English and some mathematical formulae and a lot of um, still ambiguity which is there and which 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 also can be there in the paper because it's it's meant to be read by colleagues who, who know these things but then we we transfer those into into specifications semi-formal or formal which really pin down all these ambiguities and are then um, consumable 
by both by the researchers so that they can check that this is actually what they meant and also to the programmer so that they can go from there and implement it and also check it back against the specification via automated testing. So basically what you were saying, if I'm not mistaken, if I could use an analogy, let's get, let's say a, um, a manual for a, a vehicle and it shows all the different parts that constitute the vehicle. There's tens of thousands of parts. Mm -hmm. You're writing that manual so everyone could build the car or the mechanic can fix the car, the, the manufacturer can actually build the car, the entire supply chain can work. Is that a good grasp or is, is that a good analogy of what's going on? I like it. And in fact, too, you could um, you could imagine that uh, some electrical engineers would write uh, diagrams for some of the circuitry going on in the car and that you had uh, different sorts of engineers working on other parts of the car and they may be speaking slightly different languages. Um, you know, they have their own way of communicating about things because they're different sort of um, uh, subfields within the same field and getting um, putting together a manual that everyone could understand um, might be something valuable. And that's, that's I feel like that's kind of part of the piece mm -hmm. that Philip was mentioning where some of the um, uh, papers in, with uh, cryptography um, are written for an audience of cryptographers. Um, and so they may, uh, one of the papers that was uh, in the Ouroboros paper, there of course they have to be explicit about, uh, you know, their model that they're working in. So there'll be steps in their algorithm will be, well, they'll say like, you know, and now send this bit of information to the adversary. Now a programmer is not gonna send that information to the adversary at that step. You know, it, they're okay if that adversary sees that information, but that's not a step they have to worry about. So there's there's some, um, uh, some nice things that come from just formalizing what it does for everybody to understand. People in the Cardano ecosystem have heard a lot about formal specifications, formal methods, formal verification. Uh, and I like you to kind of spend some time explaining the difference uh, between these three things, if you can, to give people an idea of where you lie within that, that greater mm -hmm. sphere. I mean, formal methods is basically, it's, it's an umbrella term for, for a lot of things that, that basically allow you to to formally reason about your programs and to prove things about them and to to make sure that certain errors don't happen now formal specifications they're they're basically the first step that you have to do if you want to do anything formal with the program itself because if you don't have a specification that says um, this is what the program is supposed to be doing then it's very hard to to basically to yeah to to show that the program does what it's supposed to do because you don't have a you don't have laid it out formally. So um, what we do there is that we um, basically have, have a, uh, yeah, a, a specification that tells us what the program should do, and it does that in an unambiguous way. So um, Jared spent a lot of time writing those, and so maybe he can, he can explain a bit about how those, how those look and what they, what, what they say. So uh, when you're writing a formal specification, there's there's even more than one ways you could go about doing it. E even even there, there's a lot of options. So one thing you could do is you could pretend that you're, um, the program that you want to write is a mathematical function, and you could try to state what that mathematical function is uh, in, without using a programming language. Um, that might be one way to, to do it. Uh, another way you could do it is you could say, Here's the state of my program, and here, here are all the different um, operations you can use to change state from piece to piece. Here's operationally what you do um, at every step, unambiguously. If you're in this situation and you see this, do this. Um, so yeah, so we've written uh, the most recent uh, formal specifications in the second style, this sort of operational style. Um, yeah, so, and I could explain more about um, what, what exactly they look like, but essentially they're state transformations. So they say, if this is the state of the world and you see this, you can, this is the new state of the world. Um, and that should make some sense uh, in terms of uh, blockchains and ledgers, because you have, you know, who owns what, uh, what ADA, and then there's a transaction. Is that transaction valid? If it is, then this can be the new state of the world. Um, so we explicitly state um, how you make those transitions without using a programming language.